You mentioned uh, the uh, siege of American embassy. Uh, when you read the book, you would uh, understand it was no decision by, by, by any Iranian official, neither the government nor the supreme leader, even they didn't know that these students have uh, such a plan. And the first reaction of the late Ayatollah Khomeini, the supreme leader, was kick them out of the embassy. Therefore, it was not something organized by the system to use as a, a process of uh, uh, opposition to the US and lay the foundation for hostility with the US. Um, the, the, the reason uh, is more, I mean, for, for the supreme leader, which I have explained in the book, first of all, goes back to a deep mistrust because of the US policies from 1953 supporting the coup against a uh, democratically elected prime minister to supporting the Shah, a dictator for 25 years, to supporting Saddam Hussein for invasion of Iran for eight years, imposing the most draconian sanctions. And the leader is saying, uh, regardless of a moderate president or a reformist or a radical, the US policy has been constant, increasing pressure, sanctions. This is one issue for him and for many other uh, Iranian politicians. The second is uh, they believe the core US policy is regime change. And the US is really following regime change in Iran. The third is uh, uh, he believes uh, the US policy in the Middle East is uh, dominated by Israel or Israeli lobby in Washington. It is not the US president or national security who is making um, uh, policy in the Middle East. And the fourth major issue is that they really believe the US is not after independent democratic governments in the Middle East. They just want puppets like Shah, like Mubarak, and dictators. They have been supporting dictators, not democratically uh, systems in the Middle East. These are the reasons of uh, opposition to US. This is not ideological or really it is not a matter of existence of Islamic Republic of Iran. Thank you. I think I would go just a little bit more than, than what uh, President Obama said. He, he called it 50-50. I think I would give it maybe 55% uh, that by, uh, by July 20th there will actually be a signed agreement. Uh, you don't don't always pay too much attention to the kind of noises that are being made by the negotiators right now. They're bargaining, they're jockeying, they're jockeying for a position, they're making statements, but as the clock begins to tick, it gets tighter and tighter and they start actually doing things. So uh, there's a real possibility that that will happen. But uh, on the second one, um, the, a group that I'm associated with was running an office pool on sort of what do you think... Uh, when do you think an agreement would actually be signed? Uh, not, uh, and it, tw July 20th was okay, but what, what if it went over? I picked August 9th. Um, and the, the basically you stop the clock and you keep on with negotiations for a while. In the meantime, Ramadan is over in the, the Middle East and the um, Congress has gone on vacation. So everybody's out of town. Nobody's in Washington. You pick a Saturday. And which is what the, August 9th is a Saturday. Uh, you pick a Saturday and you present the uh, agreement, signed, sealed, done, all of that. And, uh, and, and then that things fall where they may. But you've got a month basically to play with before Congress fully gets back into action. Uh, that's my theory, okay? Uh, so, uh, but they could postpone it for six months. And there's, there's no real telling, and a lot of it has to do with just how far they are. I frankly, because as I said before, both countries really want this. They see this as a unique possibility. Uh, when President Rouhani and Mr. Zarif were here um, in New York the last time, uh, like many other people, I met with them in, in meetings and the like, and they both said now or never that if we don't do it this time, it's never going to get done. And frankly, I, I think they're right about that. And I think they're right about it on the U.S. side as well. 
that if this doesn't get done this time, it's hard to imagine a set of circumstances where we will come back and revisit it again. Um, in my knowledge, um, the U.S. did not say no. We actually provided Iran with a nuclear reactor, free, gave it to them, gave them fuel for 20 years, uh, which is still functioning in Tehran. Um, I know that the, um, the Ford administration, which was right after that uh, period, in fact approved uh, the sale of, nu of uh, nuclear reactors to Iran. I was actually with Jimmy Carter in Tehran uh, in that uh, famous period of the, you know, New Year's Eve uh, of 1978-79, um, uh, when in fact they agreed on the sale of a nuclear reactor to Iran. So I don't, uh, there's something wrong with that uh, statement. I mean, the, the reality is that the United States had severe limitations about Iran developing nuclear weapons, but in terms of providing them the wherewithal to build nuclear reactors and develop a nuclear program of their own, I'm not aware that we stood in their way at all. Uh, I have documented in my book the U.S. policy on nuclear before revolution. I mean, it was actually Iranian nuclear program brought uh, by the U.S. And the U.S. really laid the foundation of a nuclear Iran. It was not Islamic Republic of Iran. And the U.S. proposed Iran to have 20 nuclear power plants by 1994 under the umbrella of uh, Atom for Peace. And uh, in 1976, when Gerald Ford, the president, issued a directive for Iran to have full fuel cycle, before signing such a directive, he had a report from CIA that if the Shah were alive by 1984, he would possess nuclear bomb. Despite of such a report, he signed the directive. 